Hey family, so good to see you. Thank you for joining us on Easter weekend. I'm so excited uh, to be able to share the word with you today. Today is our day as believers, as followers of Christ. This is our day to celebrate and rejoice the resurrection and the life. As always, before we get into the word, let's take a moment. Uh, let's pause. Let's get still. Let's invite God into the space where we're at today. Hopefully you're watching with family or friends or you invited co-workers to come and join you. Uh, but let's take a minute just to pause. Don't worry about what's going on around you. Just invite God into the space. God, we love you. We love that we can come together, we can celebrate today the finished work of the cross. We love that we get to live out the resurrection life. We're so thankful that you saw us fit, that you loved us so much, that you sent your only begotten son so that we may have life. Let us remember today, let us remember in this moment all that you have done for us. We give you glory, we give you honor, we ask all these things in your name, amen. Guys, go with me today to Matthew chapter 28, and I'm going to read verses 11 through 14 in the NIV version. But as you go in there, I'm going to give you some background. So there's a small portion of scripture, but a lot of background. So we are in the Easter weekend, and most of us who have some sort of church reference, we know what this means. There's Good Friday, there's the silence of Saturday, and there's the resurrection, our, our day today that we're celebrating. This death that Jesus experienced as he was handed over into the hands of the Gentiles is one of the most gruesome deaths ever experienced in the earth. Jesus was ridiculed. He was whipped. He had a crown of thorns put on his head. His clothes were, were gambled for. He was urinated on. He was publicly humiliated. He was, he, he, it was the, the worst experience that somebody could ever have. His face was so deformed, it says that he wasn't physically recognizable to the people around him. This is the type of, of death that he had. But we must remember also in all of this that his life wasn't taken from him, but he gave it up. He gave it up and he gave it up for us. So these things have taken place already in the scripture where, we, where we're picking up today. And as these things have happened, that evening, there's a man named Joseph from Arimathea, and he comes, he's a wealthy man, he was one of Jesus' disciples, and he asked Pilate for the body. He wanted to give Jesus a, 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 a respect, a dignity, a, a, the decency of burial. So he takes him, there's a tomb that he's built, nobody's ever been placed in there before. He placed him in the tomb, he rolls the stone, and the scripture said that some of the women were there when he was doing this. Now, after Sabbath, the women return. They return. They want to come and pay their respects and their honors. And as they do this, there is an earthquake that happens. It's an earthquake. And now all of a sudden, the angel of the Lord appears, rolls away the stone, and he's, he's sitting on top of the stone. And he's telling the women, hey, <laughs> who you came to find, he is not here. What he has been telling you, what he has spoken, what the prophets have foretold, it has happened. Jesus is alive. Now, while he is sharing this, there are also the Roman guards and the soldiers that are there. The Pharisees, the religious leaders, the, the chief high priest, they went to Pilate and they said, hey, this Jesus guy was telling people, after three days, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be raised from the dead. I'm going to come back to life. So they said, Will you put some guards there to guard to make sure none of his disciples come and steal his body away? So Pilate honored their request and he put some Roman guards that were there. They are also there while this is taking place. They are also there while the angel of the Lord is there. So the women are afraid. The Roman guards are afraid. It said that they fell out as if they were dead. <laughs> the women are astonished. They're hearing the news. And then the angel commissions them and says, go and share the news. Go and share this with your brothers. Go and share this with the disciples. And as they're on their way to do this, Jesus meets them. And he confirms everything that the angel is saying. And he's saying, hey, I'm going to connect with you guys in Galilee. Go and, and, and do these things 
that you have been commissioned to go and do. This is where we're going to pick up here in the scripture. In verse 11, it reads, it said, while the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priest everything that had happened. When the chief priest had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, you ought to say his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. And may God add a blessing to our reading of the word today. God, we thank you uh, for your word. We thank you that it is alive and active, that it is sharper than a double-edged sword, dividing bone from marrow, soul from spirit. It judges and discerns the thoughts of our hearts. Let it be a mirror in front of us today, a mirror we can see inside of ourselves Holy Spirit, come and do what only you can do. Move how only you can move and minister to us. We love you. We honor you. Our hearts are open. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Guys, so we are in the season. We are in the season to reflect and to meditate and to think about the life of Christ and the price that he paid. Maybe some of you were able to journey with us over this weekend. Uh, We had a Good Friday Uh, gathering. And it was here that we reflected on the last seven words of Christ and what those things mean. And it was a somber moment. And and we were thinking and meditating on on his death and what that means in our lives. And then on Saturday, we were able to uh, go and connect with Mama Nooks. And we discussed the silence of Saturday and how that feels sitting in that tension and, and, and what all that means. And today we get to talk about the resurrection. The resurrection is one of the cornerstones of our faith. It is one of the the fundamental aspects of our faith. It's this story that we have hope in. It's this story that we trust. It's this, this story that we share with other people. This is the gospel. But it is a story and a gospel that has been confronted and been under attack for many, many years. We even see in the scripture as the the guards and the women, they're going to share the story. They're going to share this gospel. There are plans that are devised to tell another story. And I think in 2023, we're still dealing with the same thing. I oftentimes describe to people this is the age of confusion to confuse and distort and to bring in different narratives. But I think as Christians, as we are celebrating this day and meditating and reflecting on this day, it's important that we are rooted in the resurrection. Jesus is the, he's the way, he's the truth, he's the life. And I think there's some things that we can um, really learn from this passage today. So the, the, the women were going in a direction and the guards were going in a direction. Now here are these two groups of people, they get the same news But they have two totally different experiences. The women, they are there to honor. They are there to pay their respects. They are grieving. They are mourning. They are there out of their love for Jesus. This is what has placed them there. This is why they have come back to the tomb. He was a friend. He was a leader. He was a mentor. He was a person of great value in their life. And they own this journey of, of expressing that and, 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 and figuring out how they're going to continue to move on without him. And so a part of that is visiting where he's been laid. The guards are there because they have been requested by the religious leaders and the Pharisees and the chief priests because they've been told, hey, that he said he was going to raise himself for the dead only after three days. So they are there on request. They are there because they are soldiers. They are guards. It is their position. It is work. They have not asked to be there. They are there because this is what they're supposed to do as good soldiers. And they are supposed to keep anybody from rolling away this stone or keeping anybody from removing this body. So here we have these two groups of people and they are experiencing 
the same news. They're hearing the same news, but the way that they are engaging with it is very differently. The women and the guards, they both see the angel of the Lord. They both see this angelic figure that they are they're mesmerized by, that they're actually afraid. It said that the guards even fell out as if they were like dead men. The women were afraid, but they were filled with joy because of the, the news that they were hearing. So the angel says, who are you looking for? He's not here. He's been raised to, to life. What he said he would do has happened. This is the good news. This is the gospel story. This is what we, we share with people. So now these two groups of people are hearing the story. They're hearing the gospel. But now they both have a different responsibility. The angel commissions the women to go tell the disciples. And this is a significant moment in the biblical story. Women who would have been low on the totem pole during this time, during a very male-dominated and patriarchal society, are the first to go preach the gospel. They have been given this authority by God. So an angel tells them first, and then Jesus comes and confirms. This is a shift. This is a shift in how God sees women, and God is doing this intentionally. This is not an accident, but he's trying to get us to rethink about women and their role within the body of Christ and in his church and in our interactions with them. There is something that is restorative here that's happening. This is the, the first kind of move and shift that is made. The angel and Jesus could have shown themselves to anybody, to Peter, to John, to Joseph of Arimathea, to anybody who came, but they choose to show themselves to these women. And they say, go share the news with the disciples. Go share the news with your brothers. So they have been commissioned. There's a responsibility. And the guards are also commissioned because they have a responsibility to bring feedback to their boss about what has happened. They have fallen out on the job. <laughs> and while they, that has happened on the job, something has happened with the body of Jesus. And they've also heard he is alive. He has been risen from the dead. He is resurrected. They are also having to carry this news, but to a totally different group. And so one group is carrying faith, the faith to believe in the resurrection. There's hope. There's joy. There, there is this fulfillment that is happening that's taking place. The other group, the guards, they're carrying fear. There is fear of what will happen next. This fear leads to control and deception and, and all of these things happening behind the scenes to manipulate people. But yet they both are commissioned. They both have a responsibility to go and share this thing, but are experiencing it in a totally different way. I'll never forget uh, my eighth grade basketball trial, grade eight, uh, you guys have heard me share, I grew up in a small town, and so there was one high school. <laughs> so all the primary schools there fed into this one high school. So each of the primaries, they had their own primary basketball team, but now we're coming together. Everybody has to try out from every school. There's a new coach. This is a new place. There's nothing that is promised. And so I'm nervous. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm a baller now, but I'm, <laughs> I'm nervous Right? I know there's some guys out there that can play. I've played with different guys in the city, different rec centers. And so this is all new to me. And I have to basically prove myself to the coach. And so we were coming up on a school holiday and we had tryouts right before the school holiday. And the way this thing worked is uh, during the middle of the school holiday, the coach would post who had made the team up on this piece of paper in the gym. And then that's how you knew if your name wasn't on the paper, <laughs> you, did, you didn't make the team. It, it, it is what it is. Uh, and so my sister is having to be the person to transport me. It was part of her big sister responsibilities. If she wanted to drive and move around, then she had to make sure that baby brother uh, was able to get to and forth from his, from his after school activities. 
I go to the tryout. I believe that I had a good tryout. I'm, 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 I'm confident that I made the team, but there were also some other good guys. You never know how coaches think and how they feel like what they need. So I have a good tryout. Tell my sister, hey, we need to go back on this day uh, to find out if I made the team. My sister doesn't like it, man. She has her own stuff and vibe going on. She doesn't want to be taking me over the holiday to go, to, to go check and see if I made a team. She also knows if I make the team, then that means she's going to have to transport me for the whole season. So this is about three or four months. She's going to have to drop me off, pick me up, do all these things. So we're riding in the, in the car together to go see if I made the team. Right? We get out of the car. We go. We look at the sheet of papers hanging on the wall. And lo and behold, the glory hits. I see my name, Monty Henderson, shining like a star. <laughs> I'm happy. I'm overjoyed. I got to see some friends of mine that made the squad as well. Man, it's going to be a good season. I look over at my sister and she looks distraught. Her countenance has, has changed. She is not happy about what's, what's happening. We both are receiving the same news. But our experience of the news is totally different. My sister is thinking about how this news impacts her personally. And there's something that she feels like she loses in the moment. She loses her freedom. She loses her control over her time while I'm overjoyed. This is what is happening between these two groups who've heard the same thing from this angel but now they are carrying it into different spaces and it, it impacts them differently. The chief priests and the elders, they decide to have a meeting. So the guards, they report back, which is interesting, not to the Roman government, but they report back to the religious leaders and they tell them supposedly the good news. But it's not good news to the chief priests and to the elders. It's actually disturbing news for them. This was their whole reason for trying to plot to kill Jesus. It's because people were turning to him. They were ignoring them and turning to Jesus. Now, you have to understand who this group of people were. They were the, 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 the filter. These were the leaders of the time and the day. They helped form and shape things that were going on, the institutions, the ideas, the, the thoughts around their faith and how you lived it out. They were the ones who had control over it. And so they had a lot of influence and impact with the people. And so now they are hearing this news and they begin to strategize. They begin to plot. They begin to get a plan together because this is now messing up their stuff. It's messing up their structures. It's messing up their systems. It's messing up this life that they are maintaining. Now, they don't want people going to Jesus and bypassing them. So they're not going to point people to him. They're trying to, to keep people from going that way. And so as they're, they're doing this, they decide, hey, let's pay these guards a large sum of money. Let's give them some, some, some hush money. And so this is their plan. Let's give them hush money and let's change the story. Let's change the narrative. Let's actually tell them to tell people what we told Pilate. Tell them that you were asleep and while you were asleep, the disciples, they came. And as they came, they stole the body. This is the story that we want you to tell people. This is what we want you to communicate. This is what when somebody asks you, we want you to tell people. So their plan was to, was to distort the truth. It was to change the narrative. And for years and years, as different narratives have been told, they've been told with a personal agenda. They've been told with a motive. So this narrative is told for the self-preservation of the religious leaders. It's for their own comfort. It's for their own safety. It's for them to continue to keep their hands and their control over things. And, and they are working with the government to be able to do this. And it's, it, it's messed up. It's messed up that they're, they're willing to be able to pay soldiers 
to keep them, to, to, to have them tell a different story for their own self-preservation. This is not good. This is not healthy. This is not for the well-being of the people. I remember as a, a very, very young man, uh, always going to church. I grew up in a faith centered home. My dad started serving in the church when he was 18 years old and never stopped all the way until, until he passed away. Uh, my mom has always been involved in the church. Man, they set an amazing example for us. So because of this, this meant that we were always in at some events or when they were creating space for people to come and to, to seek God and to find God, we were always there in those spaces. And we had back then what they call a, a Wednesday night uh, Bible study. And so we would oftentimes go to that. We would have uh, two songs of worship. The adults would stay in the main sanctuary and the kids would go into the back and then they would split, up, split us up in the ages. And I remember it was one evening we didn't have a, um, a teacher for our specific age group. And it, it, it just happened that night that it was a bunch of us, a bunch of guys. And so I knew the church because we were up there all the time, like the back of my hand. It was like being in my house. I could walk through that thing in the in the in the pitch dark. And so I'm convinced my cousin, hey, let's sneak out the back and let's go uh, continue in our rock throwing that we had going on earlier. We were throwing rocks across the freeway. And so he says, yes, we sneak out the back. We go. Uh, we we standing by the road. We start picking up some big rocks to chunk them. And then I come up with this great idea. I said, as cars drive by, let's see how close we can get to the car without hitting the car. We're going to up the ante. <laughs> and you know what happens next. It only took a couple of seconds and bam, car gets hit. And what do we do? We take off running. We take off running. We go back through the back door behind the church. We sneak back in the room and we sit down like, Nothing has happened. And I'm trying to convince my cousin, hey, this is the story. We never left this room. We, we never came out of here. And I'm telling them, hey, man, I got some sweeties that I can give you. I got some money that I've been saving. Hey, this is the story that we're going to stick to if somebody comes back here and they ask us. As I'm sharing this with my cousin, I never had him in mind. This was not about him. It was actually selfish. I was actually thinking about myself. I'm thinking about my own self-preservation. I'm thinking about my own safety. I'm thinking about keeping myself out of trouble. I'm thinking about my hind parts that my dad would tear into if, if he found out it's me. It was all centered around maintaining my safety, my level of comfort. It was about me. I changed a narrative. I changed a story for my own safety. And I'm bringing my cousin into it, knowing that it would put him in danger as well, but I don't really care about how it's going to impact them. I'm just thinking about myself. This is what the religious leaders are doing as they are telling the guards, change the story. Don't tell these people what you really saw. Tell, tell them this. Tell them Jesus' disciples came and stole the body. So they're even still putting the soldiers in danger. They still did not meet up to the standards of their job. They still lost the body that they were placed there to guard. This could end in death for them. And so they tell them, hey, if this gets back to the governor, don't worry about it. We're going to handle it. We're going to take care of it. We're going to make sure that this doesn't come back down on your shoulders. Just tell the story. Just do the things that we, we, we told you to do. So we see they're, they're, they're so threatened. They're so threatened by what has happened. They're so clouded in their minds. They knew the scripture, but they didn't know who the scripture was pointing to. They've missed the Messiah. They've missed the Savior of the world. They could quote the scripture like, the, like looking at the back of their hand, but they're missing the one who the scripture is talking about. They are still fighting against him. They're still changing a story. They're still changing a narrative, and now they've included somebody else into it. 
and the guards take the money. They take the money and they agree. They agree to say what the religious leaders have told them to say. They're worried about saving themselves over saving the multitudes. I want to say that again. They're worried about saving themselves over saving the multitudes. All they can think about and they're focused on is their own self-preservation. And they're willing to change the narrative. They're willing to change the story. They're willing to talk about something else that's not the truth. They're willing to add to. They're willing to take away. They're willing to bring in another gospel, an alternate gospel. My question that I have for us today is what offering have we been willing to take to change the story, to change the narrative? What comforts have led us to deceive others? What, what, what self-preservation, what ideas, what philosophies have entered into our stories that we're allowing for it to be changed? It will continue in 2023. There will be many more ideas, many more philosophies, many more things people try to add to the faith. But it's so important for us to be rooted in this resurrection story. This is the anchor. This is where we put our trust. This is what we carry as a story of faith and of, of hope. It's, it's something that can't be intellectualized but it's something that we, we step into and we believe and we grab a hold of. And this is what makes us Christians, the resurrection story. It's where we find life and it's what we live out of. And so my challenge for us today is let's grab a hold of it. Let's be rooted in it. Let's let it be foundation for us. Man, as, as, as the world continues to change and move forward and progress and as different theories and stories and narratives come out, let's let this be our narrative. That Jesus Christ died for us. He took upon the sins of the world. He gave up his life so that we may have life. He is alive. He has conquered death in the grave. And he stands at the Father, the right hand of the Father, making intercession for us. Let that be our story. Let that be our story. Bow your heads, I want to pray with you. God, we thank you. We thank you that you came to give us life and life abundantly. God, we thank you for your willingness to lay down your life, to become like us so you can empathize with us, so you can experience everything that we would ever experience. God, we don't take it for granted. We don't take it lightly, but we honor you. We bless you. We love you. 